Bullshit. It's an OBS Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. Our guest today is John Malecki. He's been great in episode one. We're really excited about episode two. But first, let's hit the bullseye. Hey, chocolate lovers, now you can get cannabis-infused chocolates at places like Buds and Roses, the Infinite Wellness Center, Rip City Remedies, Desert Bloom Relief Center, R-E-L-E-A-F Center, for products like Super Lemon Haze, Skywalker, and God's Green Crack in dispensaries in one of the 28 states where weed is legal. It's all part of the weed industry's marketing to bring their products to the mainstream. The goal was to use consumer-friendly names and phrases focusing on helping you live better. What's the big idea? Weed is no longer just for getting high. That's what the weed industry wants to convey as their big idea. It's no longer just for getting high. It can reduce stress and pain, help you sleep, and get you in the mood to get busy. Cannabis marketers want to change the image of marijuana so it competes with other products we use to help us get through this thing called life. Products we buy at the pharmacy or a supermarket like Giant Eagle and our local liquor store. Listen to this quote from Peter Barham, CEO of 1906, a company that makes those cannabis chocolates. Quote, I think of our competition not as other edibles. It's that cup of coffee in the morning. It's the pill of Ambien to help you sleep. It's that cup of chamomile tea. Legal marijuana sales are expected to triple from about $6 billion now to $18 billion by 2021, leading the industry to work on branding and also product segmentation to increase awareness and demand. First, the potency was lowered. Then weed was classified by specific mood-enhancing qualities, leading companies to segment products by benefits, energy boost, sleep aid, arousal, and concentration. Lowering potency was necessary to cultivate mass appeal, and focusing on specific benefits enables companies to drill down by market segment. The weed industry turned to marketing to change its image, increase appeal, and hopefully for them, hit the bullseye. The NoBS Show is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash NoBS. Try a book like Real Food, Fake Food, Why You Don't Know What You're Eating and What You Can Do About It by Larry Elridge. Download it for free today at audibletrial.com slash NoBS. You have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Today's guest, it's been a great show, and we should have just taped for three hours because when we take a break and start uh, before I hit record, we had like five minutes of good stuff that I wish we'd have got. And the first episode was great. It's John Malecki. He was a three-year starter and captain of the football team at the University of Pittsburgh. He had a four-year scholarship, graduated on time while being a starter and captain of the football team. He studied marketing, so that shows he's a smart guy as well and able to make smart decisions about which major is best. He then made it to the big time, spending four years in the NFL. But what's great about John is he is able to articulate and he's humble about the experience. He made it to the big time, but it also taught him a lot about life. And he had to go through five teams in four years and had the perseverance to to do that. And he talked about that in episode one. He'll talk more about it in episode two. Once his professional football career ended, like most athletes, it's tough to figure out where am I going to have this creative outlet, this passion that I'm used to being able to go out and if I'm frustrated, just knock somebody down. Well, John turned his focus from the field to the workshop, building custom furniture and running a thriving business called JM Custom Builds. They use reclaimed industrial design to show their love for sustainable, well-made goods that can serve people for generations to come. The team creates an assortment of products from dining sets to living room tables, custom shelving, beds, and everything in between. We have to take a couple minutes and touch on what we were talking about before we hit live on the mic. Uh, you listen to podcasts, so am I. We're both into them quite a bit. We talked about Tim Ferriss and Gary V. You were given a great description of how they're both valuable, even they're so different. Let's let's let our audience benefit from that. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think I think the way people are consuming content these days are it's so individualized um, that you're able to essentially learn so much on your own time and your own terms that you can do a lot to make your life better. Now, I catch a lot of fleck from a lot of my friends because most things um, in podcasts or in books seem like, quote unquote, self-help. Well, if you're not out there trying to improve yourself every day, 
you're going backwards. You don't stay the same. And that's something I learned from sports. So the way I consume podcasts is um, we were kind of touching on, you know, sometimes you'll hop into a, an episode of uh, Tim Ferriss, for example, and it'll be a lot of crap that you just don't like or don't care for or whatever. But then you'll pull three or four great minutes of relatable content that you're able to take and maybe implement into your life or learn something from or pull a quote or get a good book reference or whatever it might be to help your life get better. Um, I think what we were touching on was two ends of the spectrum as you have life hacker Tim Ferriss and entrepreneur frontman Gary Vaynerchuk, um, both killing it right now and are extremely influential in my life. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of marketers too. Absolutely. Um, and going from the way they produce content to the quality of their content to how they relate to people, it's all about just trying to make people's lives better. And I think that they're both doing it. It's such a in such a great way that if you're not consuming their content, you're really missing out on a lot of good things in life. Um, there's a, I don't think there's ever really been a hoorah, like rah, rah face of entrepreneurship and marketing quite like Gary. He is, I mean, almost completely self-made, um, coming from his background with the wine library and then becoming an author and starting his, um, his marketing firm and then moving into now he's managing, um, He's managing athletes and he's a you know venture capitalist and an angel investor. Unbelievable things this man has done. And to see how he speaks and looks at every single day, he wants to do nothing more than conquer absolutely every single moment that is put in front of him. And, and that's beautiful. And if he, one person can get inspired listening to him a day, I know that's what he gets off on. And that's exactly what he's trying to do. Tim, on the other hand, is a little more passive in his presentation, but – He's going through life trying to do things to himself in order to help others and teach them about it, which is amazing. Um, coming from a sports background, you know, I, I have a decent understanding for a lot of the science that goes into becoming a better athlete. <clears throat> and that's also because I was well coached learning from Buddy Morris, who is now the head strength and conditioning coach for the Arizona Cardinals, but very scientifically driven individual when it comes to your mental status, to recovery and, um, you know, physical preparation and all the stuff that goes into being a professional athlete. Tim approaches his self like that. And you look at it and you're like, you're not a pro. You're, I don't, I, you might be getting paid by sponsors, but you're not getting paid to destroy your body yet. You're still doing this to help others. And I think that's a, it's a beautiful thing. And then he goes, into depth about, you know, how he does it for his mental, uh, mental parts of life and his social parts of life and as an entrepreneur and then just hitting all ends of the spectrum, which is a beautiful thing. So, um, I love, I love that I'm able to consume content like that on my terms and be able to pull what I want out of it. And, uh, I think it's a beautiful place right now for the uh, entire world to be able to find things like that you're able to relate to. And, and, and I'm a huge fan of, um, podcasts and I read a ton and I listen, I audible, um, two books a month and I read another book physically. So like I'm, I'm all about the consuming as much quality content as I possibly can. The content is there for all of us to get better. And Tim and Gary are both awesome. I, I sometimes would get frustrated that people don't listen to podcasts or haven't tried audible or never tried a Kindle or haven't read a book. And then I realized it's just a huge competitive advantage for me. So I'm glad Absolutely. that the people are lazy. Absolutely. If you don't want to, if, <laughs> If you're not trying to get better, that gives me a competitive advantage. And I'm I'm out here every single day just trying yes. to maximize what I'm able to do with myself. And I think that podcasts and, you know, long form content's making a huge comeback right now, especially the way it's marketed on Facebook and with um blogs are still extremely popular, um, email lists, and then you have a lot of short form content that's great too. So it, there's all kinds of ways to consume more information to become the person you want to become. And it's a beautiful time to be an entrepreneur right now. It absolutely is. So Gary V and Tim Ferriss, in a way, provide us both tips to get better and self-development and make us better professionals, better people. For you, having gone through a number of major things, high school and college is one level and then uh, two levels and then football and the NFL is huge, but now as an entrepreneur and a successful businessman. So other than family, who are two or three of the mentors that you've had and how have they impacted you? Hmm. Mentors other than family. Um, that's tough. So the, I'm trying to stay out of sports too, because it's way too easy for me to just be a cliche and say, you know, coach wants that was wonderful. Yeah, he was, he was a fantastic man, but he was put in a position to lead. So I, I, I currently, I, um, I think 
yeah, this, this will work. <laughs> I currently pay for a business coach, um, in the industry of what I'm doing. So I build, smart. I build custom furniture and I'm completely understand the fact that I don't know everything. And for the most part, I'm making shit up as I go, which is learning business. And if you don't take the correct, um, approach to wanting to become better at something, you're never going to, you're just going to do things the way you know to do them best, which could be absolutely wrong. So I, um, made the leap last July to take a, you know, the opportunity to hire a coach and it, it was not cheap. And I was not in a situation where I was just like pouring money in to be able to afford it. But his name is Sean Van Dyke and he is a, um, he's a business coach for people in the trades. Um, his background comes from operations, which is a ridiculously difficult aspect of running a business to learn if you're not taught properly. Um, knowing everything from budgeting to bookkeeping to pricing to sourcing all of it. Um, unbelievable, hugely amount of ridiculous data and information. And then on top of it, you're still doing all your marketing and you're doing all your branding and all the building and all that stuff that goes along with it. So I hired him. Um, and more than just the business stuff that he teaches me, he's a great man, multiple children. I think he has four or five kids. He runs his own business. His He's wife's crazy. an entrepreneur. Anyone that goes with three is crazy. Yeah. So I'm in that crazy bucket. His, his wife's an entrepreneur. Then when you go to too, four, and you're looking at this man, and he's, I think he's a, a great father. One, a great husband. He's, um, he's a great business mind too, and he is genuinely out there to help people. So as a role model, you know, we talk about everything from my, <laughs> my uh, balance sheet look good to. Uh, my marketing concepts to my website to branding to my personal life like um his mentorship as in the aspect of you know block scheduling to my morning routine to little things that help you stay sane as a business owner have been monumental to my um growth as an entrepreneur so um i guess number one at the moment would be uh, sean van dyke and, i think that's um, a great story john because People don't realize the value and the importance of that outside perspective. If you're working at PNC and you're a, a VP and you have an EVP over you, that's great. They're going to give you some mentoring and they're going to give you some leadership and coaching. But to have that outside perspective is huge. If you're running your own small business like you and I, we need that too. Mm -hmm. And so even whenever I was at UPMC in those positions, I actually had hired someone to do a business coaching for me while I was there because I said, I need someone that I can go to and talk to because I remember I mentioned to you, but it was a toxic environment. So you need to have someone you can talk to, bounce ideas off. They can serve almost like therapist mm -hmm. plus advisor. And I think that's really um, a huge compliment to you that in the early ages of your business, when you don't have that thousands of dollars to put aside for that, to have made that commitment is huge. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, perspectively able to look at myself and know what I'm good at. I know I'm good at being coached. I, it's, I don't mean to sound arrogant or ignorant in that sense, but I thrived in those situations my entire life. And I looked at this opportunity and, and I put myself in a situation to be coached again. And I'm very thankful for it. Um, and, and we've had a, a great time and we, I'm really looking forward to continue to work together with him. Um, and I think it's something that a lot of young entrepreneurs are scared of and they all they see is the dollar signs. They don't see the benefit of it. Um, and just going to the business side of it, I mean, I tripled my income after I hired him. And that's just one small sign of how of the benefit of, of hiring a coach um, as an entrepreneur. So wow. I'm, I'm super stoked. That's a huge that. success. Yeah, you tripled so, your income after investing money in a coach. Exactly. Which is which is very difficult to see, especially as a marketer, because you don't actually have tangible di uh, excuse me, data to always look at as a marketer. Um, and you you want to go and invest your money as wisely as possible. So something like that, it, it took me almost six weeks to commit to it. But when I did, I'm, I'm extremely glad I did. That's awesome. So now talk about a learning experience. And this could be at any point in your life. Uh, maybe you were a BS employee, a BS player, a tough captain, or a tough boss, or your communication wasn't what it needed to be. Looking back, when do you think you might have been guilty of some BS? What'd you do to fix it that might help our listeners? Um. So we kind of touched on this before we actually got live. Um, I, in college, was, for lack of a better word, an ass. Um, I was extremely brash in my demeanor, in my 
emotions towards others who were incapable of performing at my level. And that was strictly because I thought it made sense to be that kind of guy, like someone who um, looked at, you know, freshmen and backups and whatever it might be as people that weren't as good as you. And in, in those situations, um, looking back on it, I was in a position to help those people become better men, become better football players, become better students. And, um, a lot of them took it on themselves to approach me and ask for certain aspects of who I was. And, and after a couple years, um, post my time at Pitt, I still have some really good friends there who were like, John, you were a dick. Like, <laughs> and, and you're mean. Like I got one of my good buddies, Chris is still tells me this day, he's like, you're mean. And I'm like, I know I'm not mean now. I know I was then. And I know who I was because I, I didn't know anything else. And to be down your throat, if you were messing up, if you were late for something, I was telling you before coach was, and then we were all getting punished together. So I was furious like for days <laughs> and I let you hear about it. Um, and I, I didn't let you live it down. And I thought that that was the best way for me to go about it as a leader. Looking back on it, it's not always good to push that hard or to use certain language. So now when I'm in situations in which I'm mentoring or leading or in a, in, in a role and, and I can help somebody, I, uh, I have to take perspective and look at it from both sides of it. You know, maybe they are incompetent or maybe they have a great skill set and they're just shy or whatever it might be. Um, I have to be able to look at both ends of it and not just try to impose my will like I did when I was playing football. Um, there was way too many times where if you couldn't, if you couldn't run a certain blocking scheme or if you didn't understand when the safeties were rolled down in a certain way that they were incapable of bringing a certain blitz and you can't run a check to it or something that it's <laughs> not your fault. Like you're not a bad person because of that. And I truly believed back then that like if you're an idiot and you're ruining my life and now I look mm -hmm. at it and I'm like, God was, I mean, <laughs> like mm -hmm. a lot of these people could have benefited from me being a nicer guy. And interestingly enough, a lot of the young kids that came up after me heard about me and how I was and how I approached it and stuff. And I'll meet them now and be like, you're not that mean. Like I just, I heard you were a dick dude. And like, everyone <laughs> says that you were just an asshole. And I was like, yeah, I demanded the best out of absolutely everyone around me to my understanding and my belief. And I know I went about it in probably 80% incorrect manner, but it's all I knew at the time. So now I look at those situations and try to do my best to make sure that I stay emotionally uninvolved, which we touched on earlier before. You never want to make, um, you never want to react emotionally in any type of situation. You always want to be able to, um, keep a calm level head and whether that's in, you know, business, life, sports, relationships, whatever. Um, so I try to approach that throughout everything I do when in football, it was always super emotional for me. And I, uh, I combat it all the time and it's, it's, it's been a learned skill, but to this day, I, uh, I still look back on it like, God, I could have been so much better um, in that situation. John, when you watch a game, let's just take the most recent Super Bowl, New England and Atlanta. When you watch a, a, an NFL game now, do you process through all that stuff as soon as you're watching it? Do you like notice you mentioned a couple phrases about the safeties and so forth? Do you see all that while you're watching? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm uh, fortunate to have a extremely tight knit group group of friends that we all grew up together. Um, we try to watch as much football together and, you know, do everything together that we can. Um, they're all married and have kids now, but, uh, I, so I come and bother their families, but <laughs> they'll immediately jump down someone's throat for, um, you know, missed coverage or why they called that defense or whatever it might be. And, you know, um, say, uh, the Steelers were playing the Patriots in the playoffs this year. Patriots are notorious for um, putting your worst player on an island and making them perform above what they're supposed to do. Everyone knew the Patriots were going to come out and try to put the Steelers in man coverage. Um, the Steelers were running zone all game and getting destroyed. No one understood why. And I'm screaming at my friends like, you don't get it. They've run this all season. They're not going to change it for one game. Like This is how sports work. Belichick has a better game plan than them, and it's being exposed right now. And like you have to be able to... Um, look at it and understand that they're going to try to pivot what they know, but they're not just going to come out and run man coverage because um, the Patriots are destroying them in cover two. So Steelers come out midway through the third quarter and man coverage and get torched. And I looked 
directly at all of my friends and I was like, that's why they don't run man. They're not built for it. And, and I'm seeing these things as the game progresses and I'm looking at it like, no, they're, oh, why were they impressed? They're not impressed. They're in two man. They have two high safeties and one man, um, in one corner in man. And they're able to roll the coverage and bring blitzes. That's what the Steelers have done for decades. Um, and and I'm looking at the game like, uh, this is so basic, but, um, I put, and I put it out there and try to educate them on this stuff. And, you know, typical Pittsburghers want to just destroy yes. absolutely everything happening and, um, love them to death for it. But yeah, I do watch the game like that. And, uh, especially offensive line play. If something breaks down there, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to explain to people like how a zone blocking scheme and man blocking schemes work and why certain mistakes happen and you know, what's good, what's bad. And so I still look at things that way. I'm still buddies with a couple of guys on the team. So I like to, I like to bust them up um, the day after if I, if I notice something yeah. um, and, and you know, whatever it might be. So I, uh, it's just how I'm trained and I can't really get away. From I think it. it'd be fun to watch a game with someone with your knowledge because I'd, I love to learn mm -hmm. while it's going on. And the best example that I can give of, of deferring to someone that knows their stuff is for years, one of my assistants, he was one of my top assistants, great, great guy, was also a whip -yo referee. And I used to say, I'd forget myself, I'd be saying, we'd be out partying or something after a game, and I'd say, who the hell would want to be a ref? Why would they, you have to be a dork? And he'd go, <laughs> what are you talking about? I'd go, oh, my bad, my bad. <laughs> and, and so what it became was I trusted him so much that I'd be watching the game and a play would happen. I'd go, did he get that right? I'd whisper to him, did he get that right? And he'd go, don't argue that one. And I'd shut up. And he'd go, yeah, he missed it. And I'd go, you missed that. But like the parents would go like, you don't say much during the games. And I said, I learned because every time I'd go to shout, he'd grab my arm and go, nope, nope. He made the right call. Shut yeah, up. Seen, so, it, seen so, from a different point of but view. But you have to, you have to be deferential when someone knows it better than you. And yeah. I'm not saying like that I didn't know the play. I'm just saying like, I'm completely biased. Yeah. That's the first thing. Every single person is completely biased. Completely. So I'm completely biased. I'm going to always see a charge when I'm on defense and, and a, yep. a block when I'm on offense. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I needed to defer to the, the ref who's mm -hmm. watching it and does this for a living because why, like there's only certain times you should argue anyway when you're like, there's certain times where you just say something so you get the next call because they're human too. They're yeah. impressionable. So I try to pick those spots by having him. Well, now I miss him. He's, his kid graduated. So like yeah. he doesn't coach with me anymore. Hopefully he, let, he taught you enough that you're able to do it on your well, own. Well, it, it's not even the teaching, like, because I know all the rules. It's just in the game when you watch the foul happen. Mm -hmm. If unless you're an official, you just don't yeah. see it. You just don't like like. There's times where I would say like that was a travel, and he'd go, "No, actually, it wasn't." We'd sit down to watch a game film, and I'd go, "Damn, he was right. He was right. It was yeah. not a yeah. travel, you know." <laughs> and so you just have to defer to who knows better. So if I were watching a football game with you, I would be like, "This is great," because I can just go, "Was that stupid?" Yeah. And I, then if you say yes, I'll go. Rawr, 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 and I'll see, scream. I, I wish I wish my circle, my close circle, was that capable of having a perspective grasp on it because none of them are care what i say they're all just want to argue with me all the time and i'm like guys this is it's gen this is a rule like this is how the game works and yes. they're like uh like no nah, well you know xyz and i mean it just turns into non-stop arguments so i have i do buddy, enjoy arguing i have a though. buddy that would argue basketball with me forever so i just stopped watching basketball with him because i would yeah. sit there and i go He's never coached a single game yeah. and he was a decent player and he's here telling me everything that's going on yep. in this game and I'm going like you just don't know what the hell oh. you're talking about. Yeah, I enjoy it. See, I would stick that argument out to the day I died cuz I I know I'm winning at the end of the day and yeah. and and it's uh it shouldn't be a matter of winning or losing, uh, especially with a close friend, but in those situations I <laughs> I will beat a dead horse if I'm correct cuz I know it's coming even if it doesn't show itself immediately yeah. and, and like I said run the whole game and they want to see man coverage, they come out and man torch. I mean, yeah. literally gave up a touchdown the next play on a fade. Um and I, here, here's your proof. You know, it's right in front of you, and then just all the sad faces because yes. none of us want to see him lose. But those situations, I like I said, I will fight that till the death because I know, <laughs> and that's just my ego getting into it. Not, I hear you, too, but I hear you. I, when I was younger, I would actually argue, and I would just finally like I'd throw out the I was a jerk. I'd throw out the like, you never coach, so shut up, Carter. Yeah. And then that's when you're just being an. See, ass. I don't have that's understood. <laughs> I'm I'm past that because they're just like they'll know what arguments not to pick now yeah. too and it's like oh, you want to talk about offensive schematics like I played for Todd Haley I know what the plays are calling are you don't yeah. you want to argue with me right now they're like <laughs> why did Ben throw the fade route I was like they scored four times on it this year the other 11 they might have missed it but you guys loved when they scored exactly if they get one-on-one -on -one coverage he's throwing that ball every single time and all right no well, more arguments John when when it comes to messaging we have to understand both our why our reason for being and our customers, why our reason for buying. And this starts with, uh, I don't know if you've read Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. 
I if have you not. haven't. That's it's on the book. list. You have to get that book, and that should be uh, very quick. I would say you need to make that your next book that you read because it's a good thing my Audible subscription um, renews at the first of the month, which is tomorrow. And I will tell you, I read it both ways, and sometimes on Audible, I like Audible books more, books more, books more for more for inter- much. <laughs> Man, is he good on Audible. I think he, mm-hmm. I'm almost positive he reads it himself. It's very good on Audible. I also have the hard copy uh, as well. But he talks about how you and I have to start with why. Why are we doing this? And we have to convey that to everyone involved with us, our vendors, our employees, our mm-hmm. team members, our clients. And when I heard that, I thought he's right. But as a company that sells marketing, we have to convince people that there are two whys. One is their why, their reason for being. And the other is their customer's why or reason for buying. And you have to hope those two answers are pretty close. Mm-hmm. Because if they're way off, like if it's like I'm out to make money and you know your customers want you to help improve their life, that's going to be a different thing. So uh, you crystallize that into one big idea, one memorable message or theme that makes an emotional impact on those target audiences. Mm-hmm. So what it comes down to is the two whys actually form a bigger question. And that question is, What's the big idea? So whether it's for you personally or for your company now, what's your big idea? What's the big idea that drives you and your customers? Um, hmm. So the idea I try to relate on the most is building the dream experience for both sides of, this, of the spectrum. Um, and that being able to um, create things physically for a space that brings to life an emotion and a feeling for my potential clients, um, does the same thing for me. It's extremely fulfilling. So I approach a situation, whether you're buying a cutting board or I'm designing your entire restaurant as exactly that I'm trying to provide as much, um, benefit and enjoyment for that experience for both sides of the party. Um, a lot of people come to me looking to quote unquote, build their dream and, and they're coming to me to do it for them. And I, you know, I absolutely love that part of it. So the big idea for me is, you know, how can I, um, how can I, you know, build the the perfect dream or scenario for both sides of us? And that actually happens to be physically build it <laughs> um, in my situation. Uh, too many times that is something that just comes with it. Um, I think way too big in situations, and and these uh, my clients absolutely love it, but it's just something that like my mind's always thinking next level, next level, next level. And you, they might just want, you know, something extremely simplistic. So, um, being able to relate with them and discover what their needs and wants are in those situations. And I'm in an, I'm in an in unique situation because I, uh, I do custom work for on, on consignment for the individual. Um, and I don't really build things to sell before, um, or wholesale. So, I'm able to actually, you know, get to dig deep in with a client and see what their vision is and what they want, what they're looking for and be able to deliver, you know, that wholesale process to them, uh, which isn't typically how it works for a lot of people. You're usually developing a product and then trying to sell the product um, to the client after the fact um, and morph the product to fit the client's needs or build the product to fit it there, whatever that might be. So, uh, yeah, I, I just try to, I try to frame what I'm doing around the experience that way the product is secondary to the feeling you get once it's delivered. That's a tremendous big idea. So walk me through an example of kind of an ideal customer, not specific. You don't have to say it was Suzanne this or Company X and they bought mm-hmm. Y. Just give me an, an ideal customer scenario in general with yeah. some generalities. Ironic as this may sound, my ideal customer is the um, is the individual who sends me 5,000 Pinterest photographs of things that inspire them that they want to implement into their home, whether it's a, a beam mantle or a coffee table, something that simple. But they're um, visually inspired by other things that they're able to show me, and that way I'm able to adapt what I'm doing to their specific need. Um, and then from there, having the understanding that custom work isn't cheap and then having the um, – know with all to realize that I'm not trying to screw you over in this situation. I'm trying to provide you with the best experience and the best product I possibly can for the best price for both of us. Um, that would be, that's my ideal customer. And I'm extremely fortunate that most of the time that's what I'm, um, dealing with because a lot of these people that are looking for my kind of work, um, understand that high end custom furniture is its own world. And if you're purchasing it, you're looking to, you know, you're looking to get, the attention to detail and the specific 
um, finishes and everything that you want with the entire experience. You're not just walking into a store and snagging a table up and taking it home. You want to, <laughs> you want to feel the, <clears throat> you want to feel the the grain in the wood and you want to have this, this color to specifically match an armoire your grandmother gave you. And you want, you know, the sheen to reflect a certain way from the lighting coming in your, you know, your great, great room or whatever it might be. Um, all of that goes into this experience. So my ideal client is that person that comes to me with the big picture and wants me to develop that small part of it to give them the fulfillment of, you know, the experience um, in the way that they want it. So help me and the listeners understand just a ballpark range uh, of what something might cost. Um, you're looking at you're looking at coffee tables and such anywhere from twelve hundred dollars up to like five thousand, and and dining sets are obviously uh, exponentially more expensive than that. And consultations is something that I've been doing a lot more of, which I've been extremely fortunate to be seen as someone that has enough. Um, experience and taste to that someone would be willing to purchase my time to, to help them, um, you know, implement it. But yeah, I mean, a, a high end custom product is something that I feel like America kind of has gotten away from in the past, you know, 20 years or so. I'm um, going anything from a shoe cobbler down to an artist. Uh, there's a reason those things cost as much as they do. And it's because the meticulous attention to detail is what you're paying for. You're not just paying for, the box stores physical product that's sitting on a showroom that they're trying to get their, you know, hundred, hundred, hundred percent markup on buying it from the wholesale, buying it from the distributor kind of thing. One of our recent guests was David Allen, who shares a passion on the clothing side with what you just said. He wants to see men dressing better than we have in the past couple of decades. And he has the same kind of philosophy as you, that there's a, a way to do the custom aspect of the men's clothing. So it's interesting that uh, Sarah and Suzanne and Mike Gaddy, when they're finding guests for the show, they're landing people that share that same mm -hmm. uh, passion for doing custom work because that's really what Mass Solutions does. We do custom marketing instead of your standard old BS marketing. And I feel like any great marketing firm is doing custom marketing. And looking back to the history of marketing itself, I mean, <laughs> even Don Draper and Mad Men, which isn't real, but each amazing marketing concept he came up with a TV show was specific to the client and individualized for that moment. And uh, products and purchasing and business and, and the world has kind of morphed away from that because it got so easy to do cookie cutter for so long that the a lot of business becomes uh, extremely brash towards the individual individualistic sides of, you know, custom, whatever it might be. Um, but I think it's a beautiful thing to see it come back now, whether it's from your, you know, like look at office spaces for some of the biggest companies in the world. If you, I just finished Elon Musk's book. He it's a wants, great book. He wants his, he wants his um, factories at Tesla to look a specific way. He wants SpaceX to have a specific look down to like the paint and the detail of the floor. That's type of stuff that just manufacturing got away from for a long time because they didn't understand that the feeling that you're, um, you, your workers had and then the brand concept went as deep as, making a uh, a board for something as small as a little part that goes in your car. It, it comes from the roots that are that deep and that feeling is the whole way through. And that comes from, you know, that um, meticulous attention to detail that comes from custom work. And you look at guys like, like Musk and like Steve Jobs who everything and every dynamic and aspect of the products that they develop was important to it. I mean, from the back plate on the iPhone to the – sound a mouse makes when you click it and you buy a Mac, like those type of things were extremely important. And that comes down to meticulous attention to detail, which comes from a custom mindset. And, uh, and I think there's a great movement in, the in our country right now to try to get back to that. Cause it's, it's important. Love the Elon Musk book and the reference there. We're with John Malecki. I'm Dave Mastovich. It's the no BS marketing show. John pick a tool that will help our audience either with their productivity or their communications, something you think will help increase their or improve their quality of life. Um, quality of life. It could be productivity on work. It could be so, quality of life. It could be communication. Whatever. Let's go with the Google suite for quality okay. of work. Okay. Um, great tool, something huge that I've been implementing into my own um, strategy. And that's from the, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 
a client presentation in Google Slides to inventorying, excuse me, taking inventory of my you know, product availability and all the stuff I have in, you know, Google Sheets to documents and Google Docs to my inbox and all of that being able to be sorted and in one centralized location and then being able to share it on something like Google Drive. Um, the Google Suite is something that I find to be very, very beneficial to someone like myself who is not, I'm not at a computer every single day. Um, I'm in a workshop and if I have a client coming to a meeting or I'm going there, I'm not going to be able to drag this entire presentation portfolio. So having stuff that is quick and on the go in something like Google Suite is uh, it's pretty awesome for business. And then in my personal life, I it's ironic that you're sponsored by Audible because I do think it's a, an amazing tool to consume content in whatever means possible, um, whether you're trying to help yourself or you're trying to just listen for pleasure. Um, I think Audible is a beautiful tool that is extremely underutilized in society. Agreed. But Audible and podcasts are un underutilized, even though both are, are growing. And yeah. now one in five Americans listens to a podcast every week. You know what's beautiful now is that the <laughs> the market for unlimited data from cell phone, for cell phone providers has become so... Um, has become something that is a uh, there's a lot of competition that you don't even have to worry about your data anymore when you're consuming podcasts and books um which was a huge thing for me for a while it was like oh crap i can't listen to podcasts because they suck up my data now you can because it's unlimited right <laughs> and you know verizon at&t sprint and t-mobile are all unlimited now so excellent was there anything i didn't ask you that you thought i should or was there anything about your company you didn't get the chance to tell us about um i mean no, I, I think this, is, uh, this has been a wonderful learning process for myself because I don't get to sit down and have conversations based on um, athletics and their development to my personal and professional life um, like this. Most of the time I'm, I'm chatting about either you know just woodworking and just furniture making or just sports. Um, I love the segue between the two. I think it is a very important aspect and dynamic to building um, – great leaders in our society, uh, men and women, um, in, in competitive sports. I think the, uh, participation trophy problem that our country is having is stems from the fact that people aren't willing to subject their children to the harsh realities of athletics at a young age. Um, and I think that you learn a ton just from losing a lot <laughs> as a kid. Uh, and you're able to bring that into your, your adult life. Um, so I'm, was extremely fortunate and glad that you were able to pull out of me a lot of the correlation between the two, because it's uh, something I don't actually think about a lot because it's kind of become second nature to me. Well, thank you. And I like the, the cards you've given here, the logoed circle, John, the builder Malecki and, uh, the build stuff that you've done some cool branding. I think that it's something that uh, lets you even that make sure you go through and then Sarah will have it on the show notes. Where can people go to find you? Um, I'm most active on Instagram. You could find me at John underscore Malecki. Um, got a, you know, anything from build posts to I throw up an inspirational quotes here and there. Um, the Instagram story, something that's beautiful. You get a little bit behind the scenes. Um, I'm also have a YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com backslash John Malecki builds. Uh, you can follow along with my building process. Wow. Um, and then I'm also on Twitter, John underscore Malecki, Facebook at John Malecki Builds, and my website, johnmalecki.com. We'll be launching a um, brand new website that is more content and marketing based um, for my personal brand. And then I also have a full furniture company brand now as uh, metalandwood.us. So you can check out actual furniture there. All you know BSers, you have to check it out. It's some cool stuff, and this is an amazing guy. We're lucky to have him in Pittsburgh. Anytime I talk to uh, any millennials or anyone under the age of 40 that stayed in Pittsburgh and doing great things, it excites me because I love our region, and we need that kind of talent to stay. So I'm appreciative of you being here. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Dave. It's been an, been an absolute pleasure. To our listeners, thanks for joining us for the No BS Marketing Show. Visit MassSolutions.biz for show notes and additional marketing and messaging resources. And remember, sign up for light reading. You'll receive timely, valuable ideas to improve your marketing and transform your message. It really is light intended to be read in two minutes or less. And it just might trigger bright ideas for you. Again, that's at MassSolutions.biz. Remember, Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, was the starting point for this. But it's, remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? Build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions.